Welcome to another edition of Maverick Tales. This episode features Andy Gray, Tony Curry, Joe Gallagher, Barry Suckman, and Brian Little. Enjoy. I can say that I wish yeah. I hadn't have listened to what Revy told me to do, and that was work harder, because I, uh, in, the, in the one game he capped me in, I totally run myself into the ground and hardly had a kick. Yeah. And that's not my game. Well, it's. I mean, you, you got to be running about. You don't play six hundred off matches and and, uh, and 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 you don't run about. Of course, you run about. It, it's just that players like me don't seem. They they're always seem to be on the ball. And you know, I was always where the ball was, as Addy was, as Ballie was, as you know, all the great midfield players were. The, the, you know, but. Um, so yeah, I'd, uh, Switzerland away. I'd have liked to have done my own bit then, because I, I played against Brazil at Wembley, and I got all the headlines, and I played the way I wanted to play, you know, uh, under Greenwood. And Alf, Alf Ramsey, if he'd have stayed manager, um, which was a tragedy, he didn't. Perhaps I would have got a lot, lot more caps because I'd played six in a row for him, and. Um, I weren't just in the squad. I was like one of the first eleven to be picked. So, you know, that was that was a big thing for me. And then I got me cartilage and missed Joe Mercer's six matches in charge. And and then then Rebby come in and everybody had to start again. And I just weren't one of the starters, unfortunately. A Serbian media. Yeah. I mean, the dressing room in 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 1969 for me as a 15 year old kid leaving home, um, the dressing room was a theatre. Yeah. There was something going on in every corner. You know, you'd have Barry Hall, Chico Hamilton and his mate sitting in the far corner having a cigarette <laughs> with not a care in the world. You know, Barry Hall just sit with his legs crossed, lighting one cigarette to the other, which yeah. I've told people before. Um, and then you'd have the younger ones who were cheeky and doing things and like cutting people's socks up and what yeah. have you, but hiding behind a newspaper, you know. But they're actually terrified because they probably picked on George Curtis, for example, which was the stupidest yeah, thing in the world. You? But they'd pick on George, they'd, they'd cut his socks up and hide behind a newspaper, giggling and like, but, but, but actually terrified because he used to come yeah. up, get older one and just pick them up by the ears and hold them against the wall and they're all going, they're all laughing but they're actually thinking I'm glad that's not me <laughs> the things that went on and then there was the, you know because the, because football in those days there was no subs for a first team mm. you were either in the first team or the reserve yeah. team so when the team sheets went up there was you know there were the, the disappointment on the ones who weren't yeah. playing because they weren't getting the appearance money weren't getting bonus money and 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 there was a real there were there were periods in the dressing room where it was very ferocious, where mm. someone was really angry and they'd be chucking stuff everywhere and swearing about the manager and all sorts of things, mm. you know. And as a kid, you're watching all that, and it was, um, it, it, it was, you know, when you want there was lots of things. On top of that, you'd they'd shout for cups of tea, and if you put too much sugar in or not enough sugar, and you used to get hammered by them. I don't, you know. So there was a, it was the old apprentice, and yeah. you were, as an apprentice, you know. I swept the dressing room, cleaned the dressing rooms, wiped the walls, cleaned the toilets, cleaned the baths, you know, yeah. swept the terrace and all of that, you know, prior to actually the priority, which I thought was football, but as an apprentice, it wasn't. As an mm. apprentice, you know, unless you got beyond that, that's all you pretty much learned at a football club was how to clean up because yeah. it was, you were used in that capacity. So it was... A great learning curve. I'd never cleaned my boots before. I'd never even cleaned my shoes when I left home. My dad had done all that as well as worked down the pit shifts and all sorts yeah. of things. So it was a it was a massive eye opener for me. And, and the first few months it was pretty difficult to say the least. You know, I was mm. I was shy. Um, I must have had some talent, but you know whether it was shown through at that stage or not, yeah. I doubt very much. Um, you know, at the age of 15, leaving home, not even playing for my county team. Two years later, I was in Aston Villa's first team. Which mm -hmm. so, you know, something happened, and I don't know what it was, but I, I, I learned an awful lot by listening and and making my own opinion on things. Not mm -hmm. not not going with the flow, you know. Um, and uh, people people appreciated that. So I, I was a quick learner. I learned very quickly, um, but I saw a lot of things which. I can understand why, you know, today we have this, 
you know the, the academy system and everything and how players are developed it's, it is much better you know there was mm -hmm. a, a lot of lads who fell by the wayside because it just they just couldn't hack it you yeah. know it was tough it was hard work being an apprentice in the, in the early days yes, sir, one thing that you yeah. didn't get off Kenny Burns, yeah. though, he was the book he wasn't a... Ken you was didn't get no like dough back from we, Ken, No, no, if ever... The, the lads used to have a little bet with Ken, uh, yeah. you, you, uh, 20, 20, 20 pence, 50 pence, uh, in, in the, the, the hotel before we left for games or, yeah. or, 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 or on the coach and things like that. But uh, it got to a stage where Ken wouldn't pay out and we was, <laughs> we was go looking at each other and we were saying, well... Ken, oh, me, 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 me horse has won, or me football yeah. team has won, or so on, so on. Um, but Ken, Ken, just, I don't know what it was. <laughs> it's, it's, he just didn't pay out, and so the lads had a little bit of a meeting and says, right, we need a new bookie. Who should we pick? Who should we have as a bookie? And I thought to myself, and I was just a young boy getting into the side, yeah. young boy getting into the side, and I thought, no, oh, yeah, I, I don't mind doing this because of. Going back to when I was in the back streets of Liverpool, my dad going to the betting shop and I would stand outside waiting for him and things like that. It was either wait outside the betting shop for my dad or wait outside the pub for my dad, <laughs> one, one or the other. Uh, and then so so uh, one of the lads said to me, Joe, will you take will you take the book? I said, yeah, of course I will. I'll take the book. And some of the lads said, oh, Joe, well, it's, it's, it's might, it might be a bit too much for you because I was just a young boy yeah, yeah. into the first year. Um, but uh, yes, uh, and and on the my first day of taking the bets, my first day of taking the bets, I'll tell you this story very okay. very quickly. Um, uh, John Connolly, yeah, Can remember John? Yeah, yeah, John yeah. Connolly and uh, uh, John came with Gary Jones, Gary Jones, Both from the great Gary Jones, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So uh, I took the, these bets and uh, we're on our way down to Highbury. And uh, we, we and he had this bet where there was three. I mean, for the, the yeah. listeners, the, uh, the three bet the treble. Um, so John picked these three horses, which I t took off him a few shilling. Yeah. Uh, so we watched the fir his fir the first race of what it one one of the three that he'd picked the first mm -hmm. one. Uh, we'd watched it win at uh, at the hotel. So then we and, and I thought, oh no, this is the first one. So I've got to watch, you know, I've got to make sure or hope the second one doesn't win and then the third <laughs> one doesn't win. So we left. We left the hotel. We're on the bus, and then as we as as we're we're on the bus, the horse racing was on on the on the radio, and it was one of the races where John's. So the first race was probably maybe one fifteen, one thirty, mm -hmm. and then we've left the hotel. We've gone. So then the maybe the quarter to two race was on, and John Connolly's horse was in the race that we were listening to yeah. on the coach going to the Highbury Stadium, and. Of course, I should have been thinking, you know, concentrate on the game, watch the game. <laughs> but no, I was just listening to this horse <laughs> race. And um, uh, uh, damn it, th this is second horse won, his second horse won. And I thought, oh, no, this is not going to, this is not very good. This is not very good. So we've got to Highbury Stadium. We've gone to the dressing room. We're all getting chained. Now, Howard Kendall didn't play on that game. Howard yeah. was injured. And he came down in the car with his solicitor. Um, uh, w was his friend. He was oh, just, sorry, just his, <laughs> was just was just was just his friend. He yeah. he, he was my yeah. friend, my friend as well. Yeah. But uh, he, he, by trade, he was a solicitor. Yeah. So he's come down with. So we're in the dressing room. We're getting ready to go out to play against the mighty Arsenal. And um, all that's on my mind is is um, is this third horse. Whether this third horse would win. And um, I remember the name of the third horse. The horse was called You Be Dizzy. All, all one word, You Be Dizzy, it was called. And I'll never forget the name of that horse. <laughs> so we're in the dressing room. It gets to quarter three. And then the door opens. The door opens at the dressing room. Um, and Howard Kendall pokes his head in and to say, all the best, lads, best of luck, you know, have a good game, mighty Arsenal, have a, have a good game, all the best. John Connolly lifts his head up from tying his bootlaces and he says, Howie, what won the what won the 2.30? What won the 2.30 at Haydock? And Howie says, you be dizzy, 25 to 1. <laughs> <laughs> And I just, oh, I just, oh, I just, yeah, 
I thought, <laughs> oh God, a dis- absolute disaster. So, needless to say, we went out there onto the pitch. I had an absolute nightmare. Most of the players had an absolute nightmare. We lost four nil. Um, so, th- so that was my that was my my introduction to being my first day of being a bookmaker. Back to your time at Aston Villa. Going great. You mm-hmm. got to fourth place in the league. You got into yeah. Europe. Everything yeah. was absolutely spot on at Villa. You were looking to kick it on. And then you got an injury and you were on the treatment table on Sunday. And Ron Saunders turned up, didn't he? That seemed to be the downfall then at Villa and certainly for you. Yeah, I mean, I mean it, was a, it was a season we're back in Europe and... Um... We had played uh, Barcelona through to two great result. Second leg was coming up, so uh, that weekend I was getting treatment on my injury, but I, I was very confident I'd be fit for the Wednesday. Never no, wasn't given not playing or not travelling a second thought. Uh, and on Sunday, uh, Ron Saunders turns up at the training ground, which he never did on a Sunday. If you were injured, he didn't take any interest in you. You know, if he, if he couldn't pick you, he wasn't he wasn't interested. Um, but he came and see me and the physio. And he said to me, how are you? I said, good, good boss. I think I'll be okay. No, no, no. I need to know today before we fly uh, whether you're going to be fit or not. I said, well, what do you mean? I think I'll be fit. He said, no, no. If the game was today, could you play? I said, well, of course I could. He said, well, I'm not taking you. I said, what? And I remember I was probably his best player. And and we were going to play in the new camp. He said, I'm not taking you then. If you, if you can't tell me you're fit today, I'm not taking you. I said, we've got three days here. He said, no. So he didn't take me. And we went very close. Um, but maybe if I had played, I might have made the difference. And and he denied me the opportunity of playing in the new camp as well, which was uh, you know a pretty special thing for a footballer to do, play in that stadium. So he denied me that. But anyway, to cut a long story short, I, and this was the next season, the beginning of the next season, I heard the story that on the way back from that game, he was chatting to, you know, you, the press guys always used to fly with the players and the staff and all that. There was never a separate plane in those days. You to, so he was talking to the press, and one of the press was a pal of mine. And he didn't tell me initially when he got back. He, he waited till the season had finished, and, and then what during the summer he'd said to me, you know, I never told you this, Andy, but remember that Barcelona thing? I said, yeah. He said, well, after that game on the plane, yeah, they was all together. And we were all asking him what happened to Andy. Why was he not here? Why didn't he travel? And he says, don't talk to me about Andy. He said, Andy's not only let me down, he's let the club down, he's let this, these players down, and he's let the fans down. <laughs> and I went, what? I said, he's talking about me, who's had injections in every part of my body so I could go and play for Villa and because Saunders wanted me to. Uh, I mean, ridiculous. I, I, I did it for an instance. I had a training session before a Port Vale game. We were playing Port Vale in the FA Cup. We could have beat Port Vale without me. Mm. But Saunders said, you need to play if you can, Andy, because if you don't play and they see you're not the team sheet, it's going to give Port Vale a lift. And I went, oh, I'll try it. So I went out and, and tried it. I, could, I, I, I shouldn't play. My ankle was n- not in a good way. They strapped it up so tight that I couldn't move it. Yeah. I couldn't flex my ankle. It was just at this, they strapped it up rigid. I went out. We were winning 3 0 at half time. I, I think I'd scored. And I came off and I said, I can't play anymore, but you're going to have to take me off. My ankle's gone. And I missed another six weeks because of it. So yeah. that's the kind of things I did for Saunders. Yeah. And he was calling me a cheat. So I went in to see him and I said, I know what you did on the plane after the Barcelona game. I know what you said about me. I said, and I can't believe it. I said, I'm absolutely disgusted. I said, in fact, I don't want to play for you anymore. I said, so if you please tell uh, uh, the directors and the club I went away. And, and that was that. And our relationship broke down, uh, and and that that was basically it. And then about a couple of months later, uh, Wolves sold Steve Daly, gave him the opportunity to buy me. I mean, I think Villa, to be fair to Villa, they tried to price me out of the market, so yeah. no one could afford to buy me. But the money that Wolves got for Steve Daly meant they only had to add about another seventy-five grand to it, and it meant they could buy me or try to buy me. And I just wanted away. It was as simple as that. It's incredible, isn't it, really, though? Because, I mean, why you needed to have that answer on the Sunday when, when you were playing no in midweek? It, it was just absolutely ridiculous to the extreme. But Saunders did have that in him that, you know, it, it was 
he was strange to say the least, wasn't he? I mean, I remember Brian telling me, Brian would go into his uh, into his office and he'd sit there and he'd say, do you know what, I want to punch you. And Brian would say, if it makes you feel better, Gaffer, do it. And he, he was just <laughs> like that at times, wasn't he, Ron Saunders? Oh, he was. I mean, to be fair to Ron, he taught me a lot. He was an yeah. old-fashioned centre-forward yeah, himself. Yeah. And when I came to Villa, I, I moved up, uh, I'll eat, I'm, you know, I moved up my notch or two when I left Scottish football to come and play in the English First Division. Mm. And he is an old-fashioned centre-forward. You know, he taught me a lot. Um, I, I, I would have to say that, but Ron. But he hated my fame, if you yes. like. He hated me getting all the headlines. Mm. He was very much, why do you want to talk to Andy all the time? We've got other players in the team who are contributing. Well, because Andy scoring all the goals, really. Yeah. That's why we wanted to talk to Andy. Yeah. You know, he, he didn't like that. And, uh, you know, a couple of things. He stopped me going down to get my my PFA awards, um, which, you know, I've never forgiven him for either. Mm. And he stopped me going to play for Scotland in Brazil, where we were playing in the Maracanã Stadium. Um, again, you know, three massive things in my life, my footballing life. Um, and he, he denied me because uh, because he didn't want me sort of going. He didn't want me up for whatever reason, for whatever reason. So there's a couple of things I didn't forgive him for. Uh, if I'm being honest, uh, those those were those were big. To deny me the chance of playing at the new camp when we might have won the game was was uh, I mean it's just it's it's just not not understandable. I've no idea why. A Serbian media, a Serbian media. Craziest transaction that that you've got involved in, Buzz? <coughs> oh my God! In what way would you call crazy? In any way? I can tell you right. I'll tell you. I can tell you what it is actually. Yeah. When I first started. I had no money, literally no money. We did a few deals, and I was living in a place that I wouldn't even want to describe it. It was, it was dreadful. And um, I was married, and we had a daughter who had severe brain damage. Mm. She passed away in her sleep when she was five years old. And we had moved from what I would call a complete dump into a semi-detached house in Waltham Abbey. And when we moved, the, the day we moved, the 21st of June, our daughter died that night. So it was the most horrendous time. And I couldn't get my head around doing a deal. And I, I then got myself back into action again. My wife really stuck a pin up my backside and said, listen, you know, we, we got to get yourself back into action. And diversing slightly from the story, um, after our daughter died, three months later, we went to uh, Mombasa, to Kenya, and we took some of Danielle, which is our first daughter's clothes, and we found a village, and we handed these clothes out. And we come home, and we decided we were going to pack every single thing that Danielle had, go back to this village and give all the clothes out, and the, and the toys, and, and pens, and crayons, and whatever we had. We went out and bought loads of stuff and sweets and we went back. We took three suitcases and two hand luggage out. The hand luggage was ours and the suitcases were full up with stuff. And this was six months after Danielle had passed away. And while we were there, um, my wife fell pregnant and our daughter is actually called Kenya. So we named her after the country, Kenya. Yeah. When we come home, my wife said to me, Silk, you know, we haven't got a lot of money. And we, we need to do a deal somewhere along the line here. And I had a player called Alastair Edwards. And he was an Australian player playing in Malaysia. And someone recommended him to me. And he came over and he went on trial to Millwall. And he did no better than okay. And at that time, my living expenses for the year were about fifteen thousand pound and we had about nine or ten thousand pound in the bank and my wife said to me so we're in trouble here we can only live for like nine months if you don't do another deal yeah so this guy alistair edwards came over and he trained and they said he did okay and they were going to play him in a game at swindon and funny enough there's a very very big agency now called stella yes and I know, owned yeah. by Jonathan Barnett and David Manasseh. Yeah, Grealish is in that, yeah. That's right. And now Jonathan Barnett got his license on the same day that this game was taking place in Swindon. Swindon Reserves versus Millwall Reserves. And Mick McCarthy, who was the manager of Millwall, 
and Ian Evans, who was the assistant manager, they went to see how Alistair Edwards was going to play. They were going to decide whether to give him a contract or not. And I was introduced to Jonathan Barnett, who told me he got the license that day. It was freezing cold. It was absolutely pouring down with rain and sleet. And Alistair Edwards came on with tights on underneath his shorts. And he told me afterwards he'd never been in this weather before. He, he was born in Scotland, but he was raised in Australia. They went to Malaysia where it was like, even the winter was like 22 degrees. Well, he completely froze in this game. I swear to God, he didn't run 200 yards in the whole game. He just couldn't move. So after the game, Mick McCarthy said to me, Silk, listen, I'm going to let Alistair go. Yeah, we're not going to keep him. It was a Tuesday. So the game was finished. Alistair was told he was leaving. And then they said to him, well, look, do you want to stay and play in a game next week? So he decided to stay and play the following week. Then the following morning, he decided, no, I'm not staying. Yeah. <laughs> and I phoned Mick and I said to Mick, look, he's not going to come back. Mick said, that's fine. I've called him, wished him all the best. And he said to me, I'm going to go up to Scotland. I'm going to see my family who I've not seen since I was a little boy. Don't even remember them. And then my wife and I and little baby had a little baby. Uh, we're going to go back to uh, Malaysia. So I wished him all the best. And off he went. That was on the Wednesday morning. On the Friday, I get a phone call from Mick McCarthy. He said, Silky, have you spoke to Alistair? So I said, no, why? He said, got a big problem. I said, what? He said, well, Jamie Morley, the striker, has got injured in training this morning. Dave Mitchell, our other striker, has got injured in training. And our reserve players got injured in training. I said, you have no laugh, Mick. He said, I swear. He said, Silky, I swear, all three players are injured. I haven't even got a 17-year-old I can play tomorrow. I said, where are you playing? He said, we're playing Sheffield United. He said, do me a favour. Ask Alistair if he'll play and we'll give him £500 expenses. And if we win, we'll give him another £500. He said, please, please see where he is. So I said, well, I know he's going to Scotland. I said, let me phone him, see if he wants to play. So I called him. I swear to God, this is true. I said, Alistair, where are you? He said, I'm in Sheffield. I said, you're having a laugh. <laughs> so he said, no, why? I said, what are you doing there? He said, well, you stopped there on the way up to Scotland. We're going to go shopping today, and then we'll stay till tomorrow, and then we're going to drive on up to Scotland. I said to him, how do you fancy playing at Millwall's first team tomorrow? He said, well, why? And I explained the injuries. And he went to me, no. Nah. He said, to be honest, he said, I don't really want to play. I said, Alistair, you come all the way from Malaysia for a trial at Millwall. You've played in the worst game possible, which is uh, Swindon's reserves. Just have a think about it. This will be the only time you ever get a chance to play in English football. You've already signed a contract. So it, it signed, what it signed is a month to month, thing, yeah. you see. It's already got another week to run. So you can play. Have a think about it. He said, okay, I'll speak to my wife. Within 15 minutes, he called me back. He said, Silky, let me know what hotel they're in. I'll play. Good lad. I called Mick McCarthy. I said, Mick, he's going to play. So he plays against Sheffield United. The score was nil-nil. Mick McCarthy phoned me up after. He said, Silky, he played really well. We couldn't believe it. We've asked him to stay and play against Arsenal in the League Cup game on Tuesday night. He stayed... Played against Arsenal, played fantastic. They said, we're going to give him a contract. They paid me £18,000, which for me, saw my wife and I through for another year without having a problem. Yeah. And he was crap after that. <laughs> he, was so, he, he was so bad, you can't believe it. They ended up paying up his contract and letting him go, and he went back to Malaysia. The only two games he was any good. Was those two games? And I said to my wife, God must be looking down on us oh, because we were in trouble for money and the worst player that I've ever had has got us out of trouble. 
And he was such a lovely guy as well. He was lovely, 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 lovely man. And his wife was lovely. That was the most bizarre deal I've ever been involved in. Wow. 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 Wow.